My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Victoria Chang's new book, Dear Memory, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after over 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support without our loyal community of book lovers in the time of authors like Victoria and Kat, we wouldn't be here today and we are truly appreciative of all of you. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us one of my favorite poets, Victoria Chang for the launch of her new book, Dear Memory, Letters on Writing, Silence and Grief. Victoria Chang is the author of Dear Memory. Her poetry books include Obit, Barbie Chang, The Boss, Salvinia Molesta, and Circle. Obit received the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and the Penn Vocler Award. It was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Prize and the Griffin Poetry Prize, and was long listed for the National Book Award. She's also the author of a children's picture book, Is Mommy, illustrated by Marla Frizee and named a New York Times notable book and a middle grade novel, Love, Love. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Sustainable Arts Foundation Fellowship, the Poetry Society of America's Alice Faye D. Castanalo Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Lannan Residency Fellowship, and a Catherine Min McDowell Colony Fellowship. She lives in Los Angeles and is the program chair of Antioch University's low residency MFA program. Joining Victorian conversation tonight is Kat Chow. Kat Chow is a journalist and the author of Seeing Ghosts. She was previously a reporter at NPR where she was a founding member of the Code Switch team. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic and on Radio Lab among others. She's one of Pop Culture Happy Hour's fourth chairs. She's received residency fellowships from the Malay Colony and the Jack Jones Literary Arts Retreat. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Victoria to the stage where we will begin with a brief reading. Thank you so much, um, Sabir. Thanks for, uh, to The Strand and for Kat, um, to Kat for joining me tonight. Um, I am actually gonna do some screen sharing if that's okay. And so I'm gonna do that now. And I'm actually gonna read, um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my book of poems first, just mostly because I'm used to, used to it. And, I have a poetry friend, um, Dana Levin, who said that this new book, Dear Memory, is kind of like a branch of the tree of Obit, and yet it sort of became its own tree. So I'll just start by reading a couple poems from my, my book. And um, the only really thing you might want to know about this book is that the poems are shaped in obituaries. And my mother passed away in 2015 um, of pulmonary fibrosis. And my father had a stroke um, maybe about 12 or 13 years ago. So he sometimes appears as a little ghost throughout these poems as well. Uh, I'll read this one. This one is called Music. Music died on August 7, 2015. I made a video with old pictures and music for the funeral. I picked Hallelujah in a cappella because they weren't really singing, but actually crying. When my children came into the room, I pretended I was writing. Instead, I looked at my mother's old photos, the fabric patterns on all her shirts, the way she held her hands together at the front of her body. In each picture, the small brown purse that now sits under my desk. At the funeral, my brother-in-law kept turning the music down. When he wasn't looking, I turned the music up because I wanted these people to feel what I felt. When I wasn't looking, he turned it down again. At the end of the day, someone took the monitor and speakers away, but the music was still there. This was my first understanding of grief. And this one is called My Mother's Teeth.
My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again on August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to, like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. And maybe I'll just read one more from, from this book before I move on to the um, other one. This one is called Blame. I'll just skip forward a little bit. Here it is. Blaine wants to die, but cannot. Its hair is untidy, but it's always here. My mother blamed my father. I blamed my father's dementia. My father blamed my mother's lack of exercise. My father is the story, not the storyteller. I eventually blamed my father because the story kept on trying to become the storyteller. Blaine has no face. I've walked on its staircase around and around, trying to slap its face, but only hitting my own cheeks. When some people suffer, they want to tell everyone about their suffering. When the brush hits a knot, the child cries out loud, makes a noise that is an expression of pain, but not the pain itself. I can't feel a child's pain, but some echo of her pain based on my imagination. Blame is just an echo of pain, a veil across the face of the one you blame. I blame God. I want to complain to the boss of God about God. What if the boss of God is rain, and the only way to speak to rain is to open your mouth to the sky and drown? So um, I will read some things from this book now, and um, just a tiny bit of background, but I, uh, I, I really didn't want to write about my mother anymore after Ovid. I actually didn't want to write about her at all to begin with. And, um, but then I had to clean out a storage facility that I had, you know, procrastinated in doing so and um, found all these boxes and papers and, you know, typical mother hoarding sort of things. And I came out of that storage facility with a lot of stuff and a lot of questions, but I had no one to ask those questions to. Um, and I grew up in a family where silence was more the norm than communication in any other ways or silence in many ways with its own form of communication. Um, and so I just decided to one day write a letter to my mother. And I'll read you that um, letter. And this is just a little bit of the beginning of it and I'll read the rest to you. It's not super long. Dear mother, I have so many questions. What city were you born in? What was your American birthday, your Chinese birthday? What did your mother do? What did your grandmother do? Who was your father, grandfather? It's too late now, but I would like to know. I would like to know why your mother followed Chiang Kai-shek taking you and your six or seven siblings across China to Taiwan. I would like to know what was said in the planning meeting. I would like to know who was in that meeting, where that meeting took place. I would like to know the people who were left behind. I would like to know if there are other people who look like me. I would like to know if you took a train, if you walked, if you had pockets in your dress, if you wore pants, if your hand was in a fist, if you held a small stone, if you thought the trees were black or green at night, if it was cold enough to see your breath, to sting your fingers. I would like to know who you spoke to along the way, if you had some preserved salty plums, which we both love in your pocket. I would like to know if you carried a bag, if you had a book in your bag, where you got your food for the trip, why I never knew your mother, father, or your siblings. I would like to have known your father, to know what his voice sounded like, if it was brittle or pale, if it was blue or red, 
to know the sound he made when he swallowed food. I would like to know if your mother was afraid. During college, I spent several weeks with her in Taiwan. She bought me baozi or buns every morning, the bao that steamed in small plastic bags with no ties and sweet doujang, tofu milk, always too hot for me to drink. She sat there and watched me eat, complained to me about your brother's wife, complained of being sick and how no one would help her. Do you know how long it took me to figure out how to call an ambulance? And then when they came, she refused to go. I still remember how the two men stared at me as if I could move a country. Listen, it's the wind. That's the same wind from your countries. Sometimes if I listen closely at night, I can hear you drop a small bag at the door. I hear the sound of the bow touching the ground and the wind trying to open the bag. But when I open the door, there's nothing there. Just the same wind, thousands of years old. Happy birthday, wind. Happy birthday, mother. April 6th, 1940. I know this now. All the nurses, doctors, and morticians asked me, so I memorized it. Your American birthday, April 6th, 1940. I said again and again, as if I had known this my whole life. Sorry, those are my wiener dogs. They are going to, actually, that one is mustard. <laughs> um, so I had started writing these letters and I just kept on writing them. Then their grandmother, dear um, body, dear silence, um, dear sister, old teachers. And then I started writing a lot about my own childhood as well. Eventually, I mean, I didn't really plan on writing a book. I was just writing stuff. Eventually I put some photos in this book and um, and then I put some poems in the book and then I cut some papers. And so I'll just show you a little bit of, of some of those things. Um, here's probably the first one I made. I mean, I didn't really want things attached. So um, they are all, nothing's glued down. I hear the phone ringing, but I can't answer it. It is silence calling. And then I um, suddenly one day remembered that my mother had actually spoken to me just one time when I asked her if um, I could record her and interview her because she had received a, a letter from a long lost cousin. So when her family left China, it bifurcated as many families bifurcate or in many ways more than bifurcate. Um, I don't know what the, the other verbs are, triplicate or I don't know, it can sever and break into many different pieces. And um, the side that stayed in China had a very hard life. The side that left um, had a different kind of life uh, that was still hard, but in other ways. And um, she translated my, uh, her cousin's letter and I recorded it and I transcribed it um, in, in this book. And I'll just read a tiny bit, but obviously their lives were very difficult and they kind of mirrored the history of China. And um, not only that, but I found the letter translated to be very clinical. I thought it was interesting. Me, have you heard from your relatives in China, mother? I just found my cousin. She's two years younger than me. She just sent me a letter. She's had a very hard life. She has three daughters. And the mother reads and translates the letter. 1950, cousin and family moved to Huabei and had to learn new thoughts. 1950 to 59, every two to three days, they had to participate in new movements to suppress the revolution and to fight against the Americans. They had to take all of their pots and metal doors and burn them to make steel. But moving away from farming led to starvation and famine. 1959 to 61, natural disasters caused people to starve to death. People had no meat, no food. We had to participate in more movements. We had food coupons to eat. It took 10 years for things to improve. Suffering in the stomach was okay, but the mental suffering was what was unbearable. I could keep going and the letter keeps going and I just transcribe that and lots of other things that my mother said because I took that opportunity to ask her lots of nosy questions which she mostly indulged me for the moment but that was um, the last time we talked about any of this stuff. Uh, I wrote other letters to grandmothers. Um, here's a photo that I found in a box that I thought was kind of cool because I see my mother on the upper middle um, and then I didn't know um, who the person in the middle was, but she looks a lot like 
like us, you know, the, the side of the family. And so I assumed she was my mother's grandmother. And then I recognized some of these people are my mother's siblings. And I think there are more. So maybe the others maybe weren't, weren't born yet. I'll read you um, this poem. Once you had to stand behind your grandmother who left a country, each of your feet lifted off the land onto the boat like nightingales. I imagine the night sky, you below deck, light coming from two moons, but only half of your face lit up. You stood still as the moons rearranged themselves. During the switch, language was lost at sea. When language belongs to no one, a door opens. And I purposely didn't want um, these to be glued down because I felt like they needed to feel like they were really um, trying to, to fasten themselves, but being unable to. Uh, other stuff I put in here um, were just things I found. So I, I laughed a lot because I found a lot of funny things. Like my dad worked at Ford Motor Company for most of his career as an engineer. And he loved to tell the story um, or maybe my mother loved to tell the story. Memory is obviously very slippery, but someone told me stories about how he at some point was the most senior Chinese person at Ford Motor Company, which always made me smile because I, I think it's probably not very senior, but um, at the time, especially. And he had perfect attendance for many, many years in a row. So I um, write a letter toward this kind of idea of perfect attendance um, being a form of assimilation. And I also felt really guilty about um, looking at the dates and I was thinking what I was doing at that time, certainly wasn't thinking about my father and how hard he was working and things like that. So I wrote a little poem and then I imprinted my finger on the, the card um, just to kind of mimic his own hand on, on a card that I obviously can't read. Was this your first job? Look at the window behind you as if leaving a country was all perspective and light. I wonder what is in your hand. It's so thin and small, it must be my home. And then maybe I will, um, maybe I'll just read, and then I play around with all sorts of things. I'm not a visual artist, so in many ways, this was an enjoyable experience for me to sort of um, just play around with paper and you know uh, anything I could get my hands on. And maybe I'll just, um, because it's, yeah, 19. I'll just maybe read one more poem from Obit and then maybe um, maybe we can uh, have a conversation, which I always think is more interesting too. Um, this is the penultimate poem in my book, Obit, and it references the Marjorie Stoneman shooting in Florida. America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child, the hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Thank you. That was so beautiful, all of that. I feel like I could just watch that for hours on end. And it's, it's just so different having the experience of hearing you read and, and sort of narrate your poems. And, I had the strangest experience when I was reading both Obit and then Dear Memory where everything felt so, so resonant and so close and of course, beautiful. And um, just your relationship with your family and, and your mother and your father and the way you write about them as these ghosts who are living and also not. Um, 
it was really profound. So thank you for that, Victoria. Thank it you. was so beautiful. Well, I feel I feel very similarly about your book. So um, thank you for for writing yours as well. And it's such an honor to be able to talk to you because of um, you know things that that we write about, right? I mean, it's we have a lot in common in that way, and um, yet our approaches are similar and different. So I yeah. I look for I'm excited to talk to you because of those things. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the first things that I thought of and wondered as I was reading Dear Memory is the construction of, of it in general, um, where, you know, I guess first we can talk about the form of, of letter writing in general. And I loved what you were saying in, in the opening about how you didn't want to write about your mother, but then you found all of these artifacts in a storage, uh, in storage that um, kind of brought about a lot of questions. And when I think about letters or even direct address, which is how I really took the letters, especially to the, um, to the ones that were oriented toward people, um, I, I feel as though the act of writing, writing, writing a letter, it's almost as if you are trying to cross some sort of um, threshold or some sort of, I don't know, like a body of water that you're trying to row across to get closer to someone or, or something. And with letter writing, there's always this sense of yearning mm -hmm. that I find so profound and beautiful. And it, it just does something to me in my, in my heart. Um, and so I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that in the form of, of letter writing. Sure. I mean, it's, um, I love what you say about the, the feeling that an, a, a certain form may evoke because, um, you know, as, as someone who teaches writing, you, it's like I'm always telling people to think about the choices that they they make, whether consciously or unconscious, and what those things evoke. You know, and each thing is different. And um, at the word level, you know, at the line level, um, at the image level, and then also obviously you go higher at the formal level of which. None of these decisions are ever decisions that one makes consciously all the time, but sometimes one may. But I think epistolary and letter form does have that kind of yearning. Um, and I think I think maybe direct address the you. I mean, um, I mean you use second person in yours as, as well. I think I think that can have a feeling of of yearning um, because it feels like in some ways you're talking to the void, especially if the person is no longer there. Um, and then in other ways, it, it creates this really interesting intimacy with the reader because it, it feels like in some ways the reader feels like they're being talked to with that direct address too. So it's this weird kind of expansive yet um, constricting kind of form. And I think that the longing aspect is, is because I think in some ways the person being addressed can't usually speak back and I think a traditional letter writing too you know like when I think of Emily Dickinson writing letters to her editor I mean and us you know growing up if, if I mean you're way younger than me but um, I used to write letters and um, I'd have to write them and wait for uh, the, the person to write back and so um, by the time they wrote back it's like I was an entirely different person and things mm. the circumstances had changed and so there, there wasn't that kind of instantaneous texting and emailing um, although email I can take a long time but texting there's <laughs> that there's not that immediacy you know that we have today in communication and so I feel like the, the letter form feels like that and feels a little bit um, archaic and almost maybe not archaic like it feels kind of like an antique object and so I think that longing is um, partially going back in history but it's also that again you know when you're writing to someone um, it you know you don't ne ever know especially if they're dead you know they obviously can't write back but even if you're writing to people who are alive it's not like they're going to write you back and so right. I think that longing is, is always there yeah. And I, I love that tension that's so inherent in that where, you know, they're no longer there. And so mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to answer that question. And so right. the it almost creates this dynamic where as a reader, you, you have to imagine the answer. As a writer, you imagine the answer sometimes. And you do that in your work where it's almost as if um, I noticed and I felt you know, when I read Obit and Dear Memory again um, this week, a lot of 
the the poems and the writing um, really spoke to one another. And I felt as though there were some passages that felt like answers and then some passages that felt so much like questions. Mm -hmm. And I loved how all of that can exist when we're talking about loss. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's so true. I mean, I think also, I think that what, what I've discovered thinking about Obed and Dear Memory too, is that grief, you can't turn that spigot off and, and you shouldn't feel the, like you shouldn't, well, you can't, so it's not like you have any choice, <laughs> but, but um, grief is always with us and it just changes, you know, form and, and morphs. And, and, and so the fact that these two books came out, you know, one after another, they obviously weren't written that close together. Obit was finished a long time ago and Dear Memory was more recent. Um, it kind of revealed to me that that we live in a culture where everyone wants everyone to move on from pain and no one's really like we always want people to be okay but I think living with grief means that you're um you're you're probably not ever okay um and that you're performing okay in your job or in your daily um cheerfulness but at the end of the day it's a it's a common thread that you'll uh, that you have and that you'll probably have for the rest of your life in, and it'll change and morph in different forms and that's also okay. And so yeah. I had to reconcile that. It's like, wait, I'm writing about my mother again. You know? <laughs> I but really I was like, feel that. But I she's mean... still dead, you know? And so I think I even wrote that in there. She's, but she's still dead. That's why I'm writing about her and she'll never not be still dead. Yeah. I mean, like what you were saying about how loved ones or people can turn into these ghosts and you're always trying to negotiate a new relationship with them. It's, it reminds me so much of just the idea of, because I mean, for so long, I think I felt similarly that loss can almost be as much a part of one's identity as say, you know, something related to, to race or place or Mm -hmm. um, however you might construct your identity. And I, I loved um, reading about the idea of racial melancholia, which I think put to words the feeling that I had, especially as an Asian American, um, a daughter of Chinese immigrants who grew up in a place like Connecticut, in your case, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found it so astounding how that term alone could blend the experience an immigrant or children of immigrant experience with loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I I remember reading that in your in your book as well. I'm thinking that your impulse was to do a little bit of reading and and research. And I I did the same because, um, you know, I I did searches on in, you know, Asian Americans and depression. um, And and I, you know, I was very curious about this and and how race and grief are somehow intersecting with each other in very interesting ways. Um, and and for, for me too, I don't know how you felt about this, um, you know, being that your parents were also from um, a different country. Well, in, I guess they lived in Hong, Hong Kong. And we, mm-hmm. They went to, you know, obviously when people leave countries, they go to many different places. So they're di- diaspora everywhere. But uh, mine went to Taiwan and yours went to, it sounds like Hong Kong. Um, but they, you know, they go to Philippines. That, that, you know, Chinese people are everywhere. And I think it's just a function of where you can get to. But when my um, mother died, um, I realized that, my whole history was gone in that like evaporated in a second. And I hadn't really um, thought a ton about what that would mean because I always thought she would never, I mean, you think your mother was, it would never die. Um, and your mother died when you were very young. And so when I, um, yeah, when she passed away, I realized suddenly I, I died in some ways because I suddenly became irrelevant because she, her body, her physical body held so much, well, all of my history, which I knew nothing about. And, um, and it varies from family to family and person to person, but my mother experienced, I think I'm guessing a fair amount of trauma and, um, and because of that, didn't ever talk about these things. And, and uh, struggled with anxiety, you know, generalized anxiety and things like that. So it manifests itself in, in different ways. But um, I don't know if you felt that, but I certainly felt like I was like, oh, now where, where, who am I now? Where, like I, yeah. I struggled with a whole nother 
loss of identity that is very much so attached to, you know, immigration and race and all sorts of things. And it got really complicated all of a sudden. I don't know if you felt that. Well. Yeah, I did. I mean, and I think especially, I mean, I was so young, so I had no, I had no language, right, or words to understand what was happening to my family or what was happening to me. And um, I think similar to, to you, I, I became kind of like a caretaker for the remaining parent and my father in my case. And watching him, though, as a, as a teenager navigate our, our life and try to maintain it or not. Um, it was really interesting, you know, in retrospect, having as an adult, not a teenager, going back into those memories and understanding it in such a delayed way where when you were speaking about looking at the Ford um, letters for, from your father and his perfect attendance. And you said, you, you said that you paid attention to the dates and you wondered what you were doing then. And maybe not thinking about how hard he worked. It's interesting because I had that experience too. And it it really pulled at me and tugged at me um, because filial duty is such a big concept. But um, also when you were talking to kind of switch gears though, but when you were talking about form and you were talking about layering these images and putting the, the words down and not pasting them, it occurred to me that I loved the idea that they weren't glued to the page because it it allowed for there to be movement. And I mean, I don't know if you'll ever go back and rearrange things or how it's stored in your archives. But <laughs> for me, when you, when you said that, it, I found it really delightful because memories are always shifting and mm -hmm. it's so easy to even go back into, for me, seeing ghosts and think about everything in such a different way now, mm -hmm. even though it just came out in August. No, I think that's so true. And and what I love about um, our conversation too is that you, know, you we have um, similar feelings about grief, but I feel like you, like for me, I don't know what I don't know, but you um, have lived in, you know, with grief for longer, related to your mother for longer than I have. And so I think it does even change along one's own um, path or, uh, you know, journey, I guess, of, of grief. And um, yeah, my mother died in 2015 and it's 2021. It's not that long ago. And um, so, I mean, I feel like, you know, things that are ahead for me in terms of how things I'll, will change and shift. But I do think the, the amazing thing about memory and grief and all the things we're talking about is how fluid they are and shape-shifting they are. And so um, I, I, I really enjoy thinking about that and thinking, thinking about how things will change for me um, going forward. And I think, you know, even <clears throat> looking at Obed, I remember I was, you know, we were talking about this before we came on is that I remember reading uh, those poems for the first time um, in Idlewild, California, and uh, before the book came out, and I was really depressed when I was reading them. A lot, I was really, I felt, I felt I was reliving them. But now I read them, and I, it's like I don't feel anything anymore, yeah. and it's so weird. Like I feel like that's not. I'm like, is something wrong with me? <laughs> There's you know? so much distance. Yeah, there is. Um, and you're saying that about your book coming in August, which is not that long ago, but I'm sure you wrote it a long, like a while ago, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, when you first, when you were writing, I mean, did you feel sad? Like I did. I'm sure you did, right? Or I did. I did. And there were so many parts of seeing ghosts that I was afraid to write or couldn't exactly. write or didn't yeah. want to write. And then it was so strange because then in the editing process, I felt so, I, I found myself becoming inured to it where I just, I had so much remove and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is terrible. And, and my editor would apologize for re-traumatizing me. And I'd be like, oh, should I be, should, should I be having this? What's wrong? What's wrong? Yeah. But yeah. the act of having to read it out loud felt so different to me. Um, and uh, I, I had to record the audiobook, and that was such a strange experience because I suddenly became aware of how external this book was. Right. Um, but this, I was actually wondering if, um, you know, there's um, in as a memoirist and as a, a journalist, I often um, get the question for seeing ghosts: is 
was writing this cathartic. And mm. for me, my reaction was no, because I, <laughs> I still struggle with this, or I still move through this grief every single yeah, day. Every and, day. Um, for me, the act of writing the book felt different. It was a, a work of art and it was mm -hmm. um, something I shaped, but yeah, for you, how do you answer that question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think memoirists and anyone reading any creative nonfiction might get that question. And, and I think it's a great question, but I do think that at the end of the day, um, you know, we are making a sculpture out of something else, you know, or a piece of pa a painting out of um, an experience. And, and I do think, um, for me, I was trying to see in Obit, at least, if I could explain um, to someone how awful that I was feeling and get like as close to as I could to the bone of emotion and feeling um it's strange to call emotion a bone but you know sometimes it, poets and it metaf like metaphors that, yeah. it does I love how um, you write about the body by the way it's just oh. <laughs> teeth and it teeth, so so teeth, visceral I'm sure yeah but um so you know if we can even get like a centimeter or an inch or even a foot away from how we feel as writers that seemed like an, an, an important thing for me to do I was like let me see if I can explain this to whoever's sitting across from me. And I think, I think I always, I mean, I don't know if you, so this was, this must be very jarring for you because I felt this distinctly, like my dad had a stroke when I was in my thirties still. And then my mother died um, when I was in my early forties. And so um, I felt like my, my experiences were kind of asynchronous with a lot of my my peers, um, but you, I think you're, I think you were 13, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I felt like, I felt very alone and this world is not interested in one's grieving um, <laughs> and uh, one's sadness, you know, as much as we wanna think that they're, it's just not interested. And so um, I really wanted to write that book for another me who may need a companion or may have needed someone who um, had those experience, but obviously I couldn't have them at the same time and right. I wouldn't know who that was and it could be many years later kind of thing. So I was trying to write a book to, for, for like another me in, in, a, in a different time. I mean, did you did you feel that way with your book too? Or, or are you just trying to tell a story? Like it does, I mean, I guess it interests me like where, like why we write, like why right. we write these stories. Right. It's always interesting to me. And it goes back to your question of, the cathartic is it cathartic right. and and so what is um for me it, it it's it's like something about wanting to to see if I can explain it for myself and, yeah. and articulate is this, are these things defined can language actually even describe these really complicated emotions that human right. beings have yeah. that's the big question for me I think I was so curious about my ability as a writer to as you said get um close to the bone of truth. I love, I love how you put it that way, where I, I always try to ground my work with questions. And one of the questions that I still don't know how to answer is, is writing a form of taxidermy or is it preservation or is it exorcism? Mm. Um, because so much of seeing ghosts plays with taxidermy mm. and ghosts. Right. Um, but I, I, I do think I'm, I'm similar to you in that I was both writing for a version of myself and then writing to understand and mm -hmm. allowing myself that process where it wasn't exactly cathartic, but it was, it was a processing of information and taking mm -hmm. in new things and challenging myself to try to think differently and map out that truthfulness. Right. But what you were saying about the bone of truth, what I loved so much about Dear Memory is the way it maps out memory in so many different ways. And I feel as though it's like looking into um, a kaleidoscope and, and you can see memories from so many different angles and understand it that way. And one of the most resonant passages <laughs> um, that really remained with me was actually, uh, you write about the stuffed Pooh Bears that you mm -hmm. and your sister had as kids, um, skinny and fatty. Mm -hmm. and um, 
forgive me, I, I'd love to read a little bit of the sure. parts that resonated, where skinny and fatty, um, skinny, I believe, was stolen away when somebody broke into your sister's house. Mm -hmm. um, and you also wrote about how fatty your, um, I think your children played with fatty and knew to, mm -hmm. you know, be really gentle with fatty because that was your childhood yeah. um, animal. And so you wrote, the cruelest thing someone can do is to empty a drawer. Whoever stole Skinny took our childhood away. And then I think it's um, maybe a page later or very, maybe probably in the same letter. Um, you wrote, I'm thinking about how Mary Rufel writes that the moon was the first poem, an entity complete in itself, recognizable at a glance on that played upon the emotions so strongly that the context of time and place hardly seemed to matter. Dear sister, we are the moon. Our childhood was the moon, entire, bare, silent, and overflowing. Each night, I do the only thing I know how to do. I climb back into it. I think that letter made me cry <laughs> when I first read it. The, the imagery of the moon and fatty and skinny being able to provoke this. I mean, it's just, it's on such a micro level, this explanation of grief um, where, you know, telling someone, oh, my childhood stuffed animal got stolen. They might not understand it as viscerally, but I felt that you really demonstrated that. And um, the act of climbing back into it, um, into the moon, into the drawer, it just, that was, Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. So you're so kind. Um, but yeah, I think I think of grief as being so many things. And then sometimes they can take the form of sense, you know, and objects. And um, like I'm looking right now at my mother's favorite chair. It's so ugly. And I've kept it around <laughs> um, right in front of me. So that, you know, the dogs like one dog likes to sit on it. And uh, but, you know, I think it, it it's, you know, it like it, it took me a long time to figure out how to to think about grief because it's so amorphous it's so many things like an, a kaleidoscope and my desire was to put it all together and to glue it and staple it and um, piece it together and then I, I think I just realized over time that um, it's not going to do that and so let it just be all these fragments and shards and yeah. it'll come when it comes um, and it'll fade when it fades and so there's no guilt when it's gone like the, like I will not have thought about my mother for you know long time and then others others I'll just constantly other times I'll think about her all the time it's fine it's all fine because it kind of has to be fine and I think um that's a way that that we can live with with in grief and then also without of it and it's all it's all okay like there's no need to feel guilty about it or or bad about feeling down you know I think um I think that's true with all sorts of emotions and feelings like depression or happiness, even, yeah. you know, um, joy isn't something that stays like nothing really stays. And that's the, and we don't stay. So in many ways, um, all these emotions are just maybe a proxy for the human vessel of, um, of not lasting. And that's yeah. all fine. It has to be fine because that's, there's no other option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, something that just came to mind um, is, so you mentioned that you did a lot of reading and um, as part of your process. And one of the things that I also loved about Dear Memory was the way you folded in so elegantly and um, so with such economy, um, such a poet, um, other other writers and and sort of the ways their works touched on whatever you were talking about. Yeah. And one thing that um, I thought of when we were talking about why we write or why why you wrote Dear Memory or, or even Obit was you write so well about discovery or writing as discovery. And I think it was, you quoted Gertrude Stein who said something like, creation must take place between pen and paper, not mm -hmm. uh, in the before or after in a recasting. Mm -hmm. And I found that so striking. And I was wondering if you could say more about that and creating yeah. on the pen and or on the paper with pen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
that may have been Louise Gluck, Gluck mm. I think. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think of writing as, all, all writing as, and this is my friend's term, correspondence in many ways, mm. for me at least. Um, I, I find it very difficult to sort of live in my own head and just write directly from that. But I feel like what what energizes me is usually some kind of correspondence with something else, whether it's a photo or s- someone's artwork um, or someone else's writing gets me thinking. And I think that's a lovely intellectual kind of an emotional ecosystem that we all live in, which is called the, you know, the human um, race, you know, or the hu- human beings, I guess. And so, um, yeah, and, 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 and the, the writing process, it's like, I'm kind of all over the place and I've have to I've had to sort of come to uh, resolution with that of just like that's who I am and so I do think um, when I was younger I tended to want to try and find there's like an answer for something you know my mother was a mathematician and my father worked at Ford they're technical and I you know and so um, I think that it took me a while to figure out, oh no, writing is about discovery. It's, it's the whole, it's about process. There's no answer. And it's like you were saying that you like to write out of questions or toward questions. And, um, and I think my, I was at another reading this week and my friend Rick Barrett, I even wrote it down, called this book kind of like a silence journey. You know, initially you think mm. that the silence is sort of a negative thing. But um, but by the end of the book, you realize it's it's actually sort of what we write toward, and yeah. and I thought that was really interesting. So I think I think there's a there's a, a proclivity of writers sometimes to feel like it's um you know, to go back to to what we're talking about initially like a transcription of of your life, you know, yes, or something yes. that this oh, this really happened. And I was like, no, no, you don't want to. It doesn't matter what happened, you know. It's like you're making again like a piece of art and that might involve changing things or, um, you know, adjusting sort of things that um, to make something more interesting and to be a piece of art, but you won't know that until you're in the deep in the muck of things. Right, you know? right. Yeah. That's so true. And I loved, I mean, I, we're, I'm gonna move us to audience questions because I see yeah. a lot of great ones, but I loved the way that you included transcription in um, the sort of imagery in the book mm-hmm. and the way it just juxtaposed artifact with questions. And it was as if, you know, you were in a way looking to these physical pieces for these answers. Mm -hmm. Um, But so we are going to go to a question from Mary Gray. And the question is, how do you work with the duality of an upbringing where you guys didn't talk a lot, but then being able to navigate a path to such beautiful touching pieces about your family and loved ones? And I think maybe it was to navigate a path to write about such beautiful touching pieces. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I think if you, like, I'm just a chatty person and a natural um, extrovert, lots of questions. I'm always thinking, I love thinking and um, I love reading and looking at things. But when you grow up in that kind of family, I, I think you just adjust accordingly. And um and then at some point, I think like everyone's sort of, I mean, I'm going to use a cliche, but we're all like little flowers and um, we may not bloom, you know, when we're at a certain age, but at some point it just, the flower just has to open. Um, I mean, there are some flowers that just sort of stay a bud, a bud and they sort of just die and stuff. But I'd like to think the humans do actually open at some point. And I think um, for me, writing was a way of opening and being who I was sort of true to myself. You know, I think it takes a lifetime to unlearn some of the things that, um, that happen in a family. And like, you're not always, you're not always meshed with the way that a family is. I mean, I think many of us probably aren't. And so I think that life uh, process of discovery um, for me was really important to be true to myself. So um, yeah, I think it was an, a form of identity making really. Important. Yeah, yeah. And that feels a little related to this question. Um, another one, which is one of the things about the loss of parent that got me was how truly isolated and adrift I felt. Did writing situate you both in that feeling, carve you a path out of it or something else entirely? How did writing affect your experience of grief? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that you use that word, um, got me, because um, I think the loss of a parent does 
get you. Yes. It kind of, it, it, it's like something it, amorphous, literally physically somehow grabs you. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so, um, I, I, I don't remember the rest of the question, but it, you're just, how do you, I guess, what was the rest of the question? Um, how did writing affect your experience of grief or did yeah. writing situate you in the right. feeling, carve you a path out of it or something else? I think writers just have to write. And so I think if I weren't writing about these things, I'd be doing something, writing something else. And so for me, writing is always um, just, it's kind of like air for me. If I'm not doing it, I'm so unhappy. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I haven't written a long time. And then uh, maybe about a month or two months ago, I said, I must write and um, just for mental health. And I mean, it's like either write or have a mental breakdown. And that's when I realized I was like, writing actually in some cases saves uh, a writer's um, emotional state. And some writers say it saves their, their lives. I say it's like breathing. And at some point, if you don't get your air, you will suffocate to death sort of thing. So um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's always so fun. I love it so much. It's my favorite thing to do, even though it's very hard. And I'm always so happy when I'm writing or even revising. I agree. Uh, except <laughs> yeah. sometimes I'm afraid to write. So it's all, yeah. it's, it's part of that process. Memoir writing um, is a different ball game for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, I think writing about race is hard too. Writing about race and writing about loss and, um, I think there's often a desire to turn away from it. Um, so this this is from another, uh, you have a lot of really great questions here. Um, this person says, I loved Dear Memory. You mentioned essay collections by Jess Winder Bowling, Sejal Shah, and Kathy Park Hong that talked about the Asian American experience. And I loved them all. Any more recommendations on that topic? Yeah, I mean, there's so much great writing um, coming out right now. I mean, um, uh, Kat's book is is um, addressing some of those issues, and um, I was thinking about uh, Ch uh, Chen Jui Wang's book that's out. It's called "Is It?" I don't know if there's an article in front. A beautiful country um, talks about an Asian American experience from uh, an uh, undocumented um, person's child's perspective, and I think. I think what I love about the diversity of all of the writing right now is that it shows um, that, you know, like the Asian American experience is very diverse and nobody is, I mean, we have, may have things that we have in common, but we're all very unique individuals and we have very unique experiences. And, um, and so I, I'm really enjoying seeing all of the, the writing coming out right now. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other have you read any good essay collections, Kat, lately? Uh, um, I, yeah, I have. I mean, I think that all the ones mentioned are really profound and thoughtful. Um, in a way, I, the first thing that actually comes to mind is Ghost of, which is not, you know, an essay right. collection. We can talk about that. Yeah. Poetry yeah. collection. I loved, I loved um, the way Diana Coy Wynn plays with um, imagery and also mm -hmm. physical images and loss so viscerally. Um and I think that was really a kind of foundational text for seeing ghosts too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you quote you quote it from that book a few times, and um, yeah, I remember. Uh, and that just for people who haven't read it is a is a book of poems, but it has visual elements. And the author's brother had committed suicide and had actually cut himself out of numerous photos in which the author, the sister, Diana Kwai Wynn, actually filled some of those in with language. And um, it is, uh, you know, it's very, a very in interesting in interaction between text and vis the visual element and absence and silence and, you know, some of the things that we're all exploring as well, but it's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And mm -hmm. are there any um, poetry collections, Victoria, that you recommend or that, you know, resonated as you wrote this? Um, wow, there's so many great poetry collections coming out from Asian American women, actually. I'm reading, um, I'm reading one, actually, I'm reading a bunch, but I'm reading one by, um, I'm trying to remember, oh, here it is. Uh, right now, actually, it's called, um, sorry, I have so many books around me, Latitude. I'll just mm. use that. 
it's got three fish on it by Natasha Rao. And that won the APR Honickman first book prize. Um, and yeah, there are just a lot of great poetry collections um, uh, by Asian Americans um, right now. Chen Chen has a new book coming out next year, which I just blurbed. Um, Paul Tran has this gorgeous book that I just started reading. Um, and, a, and I, I can't remember the title, but I think I have it. Oh, here it is. All the Flowers Kneeling. I mean, isn't that beautiful Oh, cover? yes. I uh, really I'll, want to get a copy of that. <laughs> that's a, that looks really good. I've read a couple of poems from there. So yeah, lots and lots of great um, Asian Americans writing poetry, crave nonfiction, and obviously fiction too. Yeah. And um, I just thought about two more memoirs that came out this year that I'd love to shout out to. Um, Albert Samaha, he is Filipino American, and he wrote a memoir that just came out called Concepcion about mm -hmm. um, sort of colonialism and um, the idea of imperialism too. And he examines his own family as uh, an investigative reporter, which is what he mm. is. And then um, in a Q's uh, memoir, Made in China, also right. looks at her upbringing um, in New York City and working in garment factories that her parents um, ran and sort of examining the, the idea of love and, and labor and capitalism. And mm. it's all very interesting. It feels as though 2021 is a big year for um, memoirs and that type of narrative too. Yeah, no, I love it. And I think there's um, so much great literature coming out. It's hard to keep up, but it's exciting too that I, I finally feel like I can't keep up, which is a wonderful feeling to have. I know. Yeah. And it's, I, I mean, I think to your, to your point before about so many different perspectives coming, um, there's you know, right now, a big discussion about the term Asian American because mm -hmm. of Jay Caspian King's book, The Loneliest Americans, which I have not read and I look I forward to reading it. And I think it's it's really good to be able to have these discussions. I think it's true. And I think that, you know, sometimes people, um, you know, get upset about things uh, and because it's hard to be criticized. I mean, I think, um, and I also think that our own community sometimes can be the harshest on ourselves because we know the nuances and 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 have a, a very intimate understanding of our communities, which are very diverse, obviously. And so, the, it, like, if you look past the the fighting and the arguing and the discourse. Um, I think it actually you, you can learn a lot from the conversations that are happening. Um, it stinks to be um, the person being criticized because that right. certainly can happen. So I really empathize with everyone. And it's involved. hurtful too. It's yeah. so hurtful. Um, and and but in the end, it's like I, I try and think, okay, what have I learned from from this experience? And uh, and I feel sad for everyone at the end, but I hope that everyone comes out of it with a new understanding and a new um, sense of respect and empathy for each other and what we're each trying to do. And yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're all sort of um, fighting for the same things, but we are coming at it in different ways, and we're at different. I mean, we're at different points of understanding ourselves and development. You know, it's like we say this to kids all the time. It's like, oh, they're just learning or they're just learning. If someone gets a bullied or or they're upset about something, I'm like, well, they're just learning. You know, it's like what I say to my own kids all the time. And I find it interesting how as adults, we don't do that with each other anymore, but we are still learning. I mean, yeah. I'm old. I'm still learning. I hope that people would always give me the benefit of the doubt and the empathy. Um, but it doesn't seem like, it seems like at some point we stop doing that and, and, and expecting that everyone as an adult knows everything, which is impossible. Yeah. All and different I think, journeys. Yeah. I hope that with all this conversation about what identity means right now or what terms mean is um, that they can build on each other. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's how um, communities move forward and just That's redefine right. themselves. And so I'm right. interested to see how that works. But yeah, we are about at time, but I have, I could talk to you for hours. Yeah, that was really fun. <laughs> it's so interesting. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I And thank you, Victoria, for your beautiful work. Oh, thank you too. It's such a pleasure to um, meet you and talk to you and um, so much more. I hope we can do it again in a more personal basis too. I agree. And thank you to the strand. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for such a 
fantastic conversation. I have some books I have added to my reading list. Uh, <laughs> I, re I really appreciate your time. That was yeah. wonderful. Uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us. If you have yet to purchase a copy of Dear Memory, I've dropped a link in the chat. I've also dropped a link to Cat Seeing Ghosts, which I also go sign as being excellent. It's great. And on that note, thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic evening. Bye. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. Be well. Bye. Thank you, Kat. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.